Well, good morning. You may notice I have a cut on my lip. My wife and I have not had a fight. It's a result of a cold sore. Some of the ladies mentioned this to me this morning. Make sure and don't kiss any of the babies because that can be dangerous. That's not normally a temptation of mine, but <laughs> if you think it is, take precaution. We're in Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 26 through 28 today. And you will know Romans 8, as um, Beverly Randolph said, that this is one of uh, her favorite camping spots in the Scripture. And that truly is for many people. Romans 8 is quite... Uh, the passage. We're looking at verses 26 to 28, though, which is kind of uh, the top of two different uh, mountain peaks. And um, let's dive right in. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word this morning and our study in it this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before You today as needy people. Yes, we are sons and daughters of the King through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And yet, Father, we, um, we struggle. This life is difficult. Too often times we don't know how to pray. Too often times we don't understand what the next day may hold, why we go through the trials that we do. But we do know by faith that, Lord, you're working all these things out for our good. And so we pray that you would just have your way with us. In the meantime, Lord, help us to trust you during these times. We lift up the people that... You know, the Michaels have gone through a difficult week. Pray that you would grant them grace as Gardner um, hopefully gets well here soon. I know we've lost loved ones. I know other people have been uh, ill. And I know with COVID still um, in the midst that people are still nervous about things. And we just pray that you would just grant a lot of grace at this time and peace uh, in the midst of our trials. Help us to trust you, Lord. You are trustworthy. We are not. We uh, fully admit it. But Lord, you are. And we are thankful for that. We pray that you would help me today as I teach this passage. It would be honoring to the Son. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do it. I pray most of all uh, that, uh, that you would be glorified, not only in this service, but as we leave the service and live out the life of the church among our neighbors, our co workers, our family, our friends. Help us to be lights. In a dying world, in your son's name we pray it. Amen. Well, we are looking at four topics today in Romans 8, 26 through 28. First is prayer. If you've ever wondered, I don't know how to pray as I should. As a matter of fact, when I look at my prayer life, it looks pretty bad. Well, hopefully you'll be encouraged today. We'll be looking also at intercession. How does that work? Who does what? It seems that many times it talks about Christ being our intercessor, but then here it says the Holy Spirit. So which one is it? We'll also be considering the will of God. How can I know it? Spoiler alert, you can't. <laughs> and especially in regards to God's decreed will, not the moral will, what He has written in His Word. You can know that. But the decreed will for your life, we're going to discuss a little bit about that. And then finally, what we know. There are certain things we do know. We trust the Lord in faith on that. So let's take a look. This is the Word of God. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When it begins the phrase in the same way, then you know there's, there's information in the past going on. Romans 8 is chock full of promises of God, but there's three ways in particular I think the Spirit is drawing it to us in the same way. In the same way as what? 
Well, it could be referring to in the same way as our weakness. The Holy Spirit earlier in Romans 8, He writes that He helps us in our weakness. He gives us life. He raises us from the dead. So it could be referring to our weaknesses. It could be referring to our groaning. Chapter 8, early on, it talks about the creation groans. Why is it groaning? That's not a positive thing. Well, it's groaning because it wants the new heavens and the new earth. It's tired of the death that it's undergone for this many thousands of years. And then you have believers who groan. Why do we groan? (laughs) I think you know why. We want to be clothed in a resurrected body. We want that. There's nothing wrong with wanting that. That's, That's the way God intended it for the body and soul to be together in perfect harmony. And then we also see the Spirit groaning in the same way the Spirit groans. So it could be referring to groaning. Thirdly, it could be referring to the hope that we have. The hope of future glory. And so perhaps it's all three. Weakness, groaning, hope. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. That word helps, it's a Greek word used just two times in the Bible. It really is a picture, if you will. Someone who comes alongside of you to help you carry a heavy load you can't take on yourself. We see this at one other place. Martha. She's complaining to Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 40 about her sister. Wouldn't you know it? Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. That's our term. She needs to pick this up. I can't do this by myself. And that's where the other term is seen. So here, the Spirit helps us. How does He help us? He helps us in our weakness. That term weakness, it's referring to an ailment, some ailment that deprives a person of enjoying or accomplishing what they want to do. What is the ailment? Aren't you glad the Spirit tells us here? For we do not know how to pray as we should. There is our weakness. It's our lack of understanding. It's our ignorance in how or what to pray for. Maybe it's because we're not sure whether to pray for deliverance from a trial or the strength to endure it. Or we wonder what job to take, what career to enter into, where to live, what to do. We don't know how to pray as we should. Think of the Old Testament pictures of this. Moses, he prays fervently. The Lord will let him enter the promised land. The Lord says no. Elijah 1 Kings 19.4, he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. He prays the Lord for him to take him. Jeremiah does the same thing. And the Lord says, no. It's interesting. Paul uses the possessive pronoun. He says, uh, he helps us in our weakness. So he puts himself in the midst of this. Uh, He doesn't know how to pray either. Philippians 1, 22 through 24, he doesn't know whether the Lord wants to take him home or he's there for future ministry. He comes to thinking that I, I think basically the Lord wants me to stay here. But y'all, we don't know, do we? I got this from Mike Black this past week. Forty years ago, Martin Lloyd-Jones was dying and he could not speak. He wrote on a piece of paper to his wife and daughter, don't pray for healing. Don't hold me back from the glory. But then the question comes to mind for you and I, how did he know? Well, I think he was taking his best stab at it at the time, much in the same way as what we do when we pray. Well, I would tell you this, the Scripture is very clear. We don't know. But the Spirit here intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So so the way it works is this. The We don't know, so the Spirit intercedes for us. The person that intercedes, He comes and He pleads our case before the one who's in charge. And we see in John 14, 16, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to remain within us, to be with us, to be our intercessor. And yet in Hebrews 7, 25, we read that Christ always lives to make intercession for them. So, question, who intercedes before you before the Father? Well, I think it's both. We have in God's incredible grace, we have the Spirit who intercedes in our hearts. 
while Jesus Christ is interceding in the court of heaven. We see Jesus here also, He intercedes for Simon Peter. We have a good example of this when He says, I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. He says, I've prayed for you, but you're going to fail in essence. So strengthen your brothers. So basically when it comes down to it, we have two divine intercessors. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. God, God the Holy Spirit writes our prayers, God the Son presents our prayers, and God the Father accepts our prayers. And with the whole Trinity to help us in it, what cannot prayer perform? I mean, I think the problem with you and me is we tend to discount prayer. We don't see it for what it really is, a Trinitarian experience. Notice it says, how does He do it? With groanings too deep for words. Only place we see this in Scripture. Uh, it's not the gift of tongues, which is the Greek word glossalia, which means words. No, these aren't words. They're wordless groanings. They're yearnings. You can't hear them as you pray. But they do have content. It's, it's, it's not nothing. It is something. They do have content, but words are not necessary. You know why? Because the Trinity is speaking to the Trinity. They don't need words. So we have these sort of groanings. Once again, to, to relate it back to the rest of Romans 8, in verses 22, 23, and 26, we've got groanings of inanimate creation. And then we have groanings of redeemed humanity that we ourselves groan within us. And then we have the groanings of the Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit and us, if you will, we groan together. Isn't that a sweet picture? Well, once he groans, what do we have? Verse 27. And he who searches the hearts, meaning the Father, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he, the Holy Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the picture is this. God the Father searches the hearts. Now, if you're an unbeliever today, this is one of the more frightening parts of Scripture. I witnessed to a gentleman the other day who's an atheist, and we talked a little bit about uh, Christianity, and uh, he was very adamant. There was nothing out there, uh, nothing. And I pointed to his Jeep. I said, that's a good-looking vehicle. Who built it? And he said, oh, that's, that's a Jeep. Yeah, I, I love that car. It was, I said, who built it? Oh, I guess Detroit. Really? So something built this. Yes, of course. And then I brought it back to, really, take a look at the world. God's incredible creation. And nothing created it. What I'm getting to is this. This passage is one of the more frightening parts of Scripture because the Lord can look right into His heart. He knows exactly that a fool says in his heart there is no God. He's fooling himself. He knows better. But to a believer, this passage is nothing but the most comforting Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? The Lord sees all things. He knows all things. He knows what you're going through. So it says, he who knows what the mind of the spirit is, notice, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Father fully knows the mind of the spirit. Of course he does. It's the same essence. So, interesting, the way it works is like this. The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So what happens when we pray? The Holy Spirit makes corrections to our misdirected prayers, basically. He fixes our prayers. Dan Duncan puts it this way. When our prayers contradict God's greater will, the Spirit overrules us in favor of the Father. We may not understand it at the time, and we may be completely perplexed when our prayers aren't answered. But we know this. We know that God is all wise, far wiser than us, and His plans are best. That's living by faith, trusting Him in spite of the circumstances. Ambrose did a really good job of explaining this in the fourth century. Ambrose was very impactful in winning Augustine to Christ. Ambrose would talk about this passage, and he said, if you will, it's like a boy who finds out his father is coming home, and he goes out to the field and he picks 
every sort of plant he can. He wants to pick all these flowers for his father. And as he's bringing it back to the house, his mother says, son, stop. What do you got there? And he said, I have all these flowers for father. And she says, hold on a second. Let me take a look at this. And she takes the flowers, quote unquote flowers, and she picks out the poison ivy and the dandelions and everything that doesn't fit to go to the father. And then she says, okay, let's go deliver it together. That's the picture of our prayers. The Lord in His kindness fixes our prayers. Well, how about discovering the will of God? That's a common phrase these days. How can you discover the will of God? I, I, James Montgomery Boyce, I wish I had read this when I was coming right out of college. He said it very well. He says, we may not know the will of God. But we do not need to be under pressure to discover it, fearing that if we miss it, somehow we will be doomed to a life outside the center of God's will or to God's quote-unquote second best. That's not thinking biblically. We need to trust the Lord. He will do what He will. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Augustine speaks of the will of God and he says, in essence, pray about it and do what you want. There's nothing mystical about this. Pray about it and do what you want, as long as it's not opposed to Scripture. You see, the Holy Spirit knows something that you and I can't know, and that is the decreed will of God for our lives. So the strong encouragement is don't let what you don't know about the will of God stop you from praying. You don't know it. It's not your job to figure it out. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed, i.e. the Scriptures, belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. So if you will, quit trying to look behind the curtain. You can't. So, a good example of this, and someone who thought she knew the will of God as much as we all think we do, Monica, Monica, the, the mother of Augustine, as you know, Augustine was a wicked son for years. Well, Monica prayed for his salvation for years, and yet Augustine was not interested. And at the end of the day, he had a great desire to move to Rome, which was the most debaucherous city, perhaps, in the empire. She begged him not to go. She cried. She prayed hard about it. She even followed him to the coast as he left, begging him not to go. What happened? He went to Rome. He stayed there for a year. After teaching all of his students rhetoric, they failed to pay him. And then he took off and went to a place called Milan, where God in his sovereign providence connected him to a guy named Ambrose, who taught him the word of God and became a believer. You see, the best thing that could have happened to Augustine is just the opposite of what Monica prayed for. We don't know how to pray as we should. Well, what does the Holy Spirit pray for? Well, he prays for us the will of God, or to put it in a different way, our good, which I'm going to define that term in just a little bit. But note what we see in the Old Testament regarding believers of the new covenant. Jeremiah 32, 40, I will never stop doing good to them. Psalm 23, 6, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Psalm 121, verse 7 and 8, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So it sounds like we are pursued every day with God's goodness and His loving kindness. And the answer to that is, of course we are. We're pursued much in the same way the way a hound would pursue a fox. He's on your trail. He's coming after you with goodness. But when you look at your average everyday life, you go... It doesn't look like goodness to me. We'll see. Verse 28, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So note it says we know. We don't know how to pray as we should. We don't know the Lord's will, but we know this by faith that the Lord is causing all things to work for our good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. What do we do? We believe it by faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is being sure 
of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. So I'd like to share with us five things we can know in Romans 8.28. We have five convictions. The first one is this. God causes all things. You could put it this way, is that God orchestrates every single event in our life. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father? And indeed, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. He continues to go back to this, don't be worried, don't be worried, don't be worried. And what do we do? Worry, worry, worry. You see, when it comes down to it, it is not helpful Nor is it biblical to believe that somehow God stepped away from His throne and you got hit with a trial. It's not helpful, and especially it's not biblical. God is not the author of sin, and yet ultimately He is the first cause of all things. give you some scriptures to back that up. Job 121, as Job has now lost all of his children, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Isaiah 45, 7, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Amos 3, 6, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Now, once again, he is not the author of evil, but he uses evil as a tool for his own good purposes. The best example of that we can find in Acts 2.23. This man, meaning Jesus Christ, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of a godless man and put to death. Do you see this? Do you see God's sovereignty and human responsibility? Do you understand it? No. Neither do I. To quote Charles Spurgeon again, he says, Can you understand it? For I cannot. How a man is a free agent, a responsible agent, so that his sin is his own willful sin and lies with him and never with God. And yet at the same time, God's purposes are fulfilled and his will is done even by demons and corrupt men. I cannot comprehend it without hesitation. I believe it and rejoice to do so. I never hope to comprehend it. I worship a God I never expect to comprehend. It is my firm belief that everything in heaven, earth, and hell will soon, or rather will be seen to be in the long run part of the divine plan. Yet never is God the author or accomplice of sin. Sin rests with man, holy with man, and yet by some strange overruling force, godlike and mysterious, like the existence of God, His supreme will is accomplished. To deny this truth because we cannot understand it is to shut ourselves out of a great deal of important knowledge. What's he saying? I don't get it. And I'll be the first one to admit it. I don't understand that. But notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that I don't believe it is true. To quote Augustine again, we believe in order that we may understand. It's not the other way around. So, God causes all things. Number two, to work together for good. Okay, there's our word again. Now it's probably time for us to define it. What is good? What is good for us? Would you say health? Would you say money? Perhaps many people would define good as maximum pleasure, minimum pain. That's not the way the Bible defines goodness for you. If you will, a verse that we won't exegete today, but just read chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom He foreknew, that means His elect, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. You see good there? Is there a higher good for man than to be like his Maker? I'm going to ask it again. Is there a higher good for man than to be like his Maker? Of course not. God makes sure in His providence that everything that happens to us is working out for our ultimate good to be shaped into the image of Jesus Christ and for His glory. Good example of this, who thought he knew how to pray, but he didn't. 
Even the Apostle Paul, who saw the resurrected Christ. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9, Paul was denied by the Lord three times to have his thorn in the flesh taken away from him. Why? I mean, thinking about with, from Paul's situation, whatever that thorn in the flesh was, it would seem like if the Lord could take that away, would take that away, how much more effective his ministry would be. Perhaps how many more people he could talk to about the Lord. He could lead more Bible studies, but because of this thorn... But that's not what the Lord has for him, right? The Lord has something better for him called humility. My power is perfected in weakness. Paul, you need to feel weak. And so I'm not taking the thorn away. It's yours. And so we see in God's grace, Paul actually praises him for it. So let me caveat something here if you happen to mistake what I'm saying. This text in Romans 8, verse 28, is not teach that sickness, suffering, and death are good. Nor is it saying that Satan does not have a role to play in this life where he seeks to destroy the saints. Okay? And yet, at the same time, that those, those things are bad. But it shows in this text that God can, does, and must use those tools to affect good ends for His people. It's not that he just, he can do this, whatever situation you're dealing with. He can bring good out of it. And it's not necessarily that he does bring good out of it. Those are both true. We need to remember, God must bring good out of it. Why do you say must? Because the Bible says so. And this is what the Lord holds himself to. Not what we hold him, but this is what he holds himself to. So he, he does it. He does this. Psalm 119, verse 71, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Good example of an Old Testament character that was afflicted, that could see God's sovereignty later on, Joseph. Favorite son of his father, good looking, nice, bright future, sold into slavery in Egypt by his own brothers. And you know the story. But by the end of his life in Genesis 45, or at least not the end of his life, but later on when he, he introduces himself to his brothers, it says he wept and he falls upon the necks of his brothers saying, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. You would think that that would make his brothers understand, but they don't. Because later on after Jacob is dead, his brothers sent word to him saying, basically, please don't commit vengeance upon us for what we did to you. And we see Joseph weeping again. Genesis 50, verse 19 and 20. Do not be afraid, for I am, in, am I in God's place? And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. I love the fact that he's got really great theology. He doesn't pull back from saying, he doesn't say, what y'all did wasn't wrong. No, he said, what you did, were, it was wrong. It was evil. But God meant it for good. So, are you saying the biblical text is saying all things work together for good? I understand, okay, trials, sure, there's a good example of that. But what about failures? What about my failures? What about my sin that I commit every day? That's working for my good? Well, let's give you an, an example of Peter. Luke 22. He's so cocky. When you read Peter, sometimes I laugh out loud as I'm reading the story of Peter because he says, though they will all deny you, I will never do it. And I think, oh, this guy is so cocky. He's, so, he's such a braggart. And yet the Lord makes it clear, no, you, you are going to deny me. Um... So think about this. What great sin could that be to deny the Son of God? What great failure. And yet, what happens? He comes away a more humble man. As a matter of fact, you've all read the Gospel of Mark. Papias of Heriopolis, who lived in the uh, 60 to 130 A.D., he said that the testimony of the disciples of the apostles claimed that Mark wrote his gospel in Rome as scribed by the preaching of Peter. So if you will, when you read Mark, 
if the disciples of the apostles are correct, and I think they are, you're actually reading Peter's recollections by inspiration of the Spirit. And what does Peter call Mark in 1 Peter 5.13? He calls him my son. Why are you pulling Mark into the situation? Because this. If you remember in the book of Acts, Mark failed terribly. He abandoned them. Strong word. In the midst of the first missionary journey. And yet, the Lord in His providence kept Mark from a life of failure. I think by two men in particular. One was his cousin Barnabas, which wasn't his real name. His real name was Joseph. But they called him Barnabas because he was a son of encouragement. That's exactly the person that Mark needed in his life. But also Peter. Peter, a man who knew failure. Who had some indications of what it's like to fail. And not just fail, but sin in a big way. Augustine puts it this way, God would never permit evil if He could not bring good out of evil. He wouldn't permit it if He couldn't bring good out of it. Now even as we say this, I'm saying it a little bit with trepidation. Uh, Thomas Watson, one of my favorite Puritans, he wrote a book called All Things for Good, and he talks about this. Be careful, believer, if you think somehow that sin is going to be... Uh, sure, God will use it to your good, but be careful lest you treated in a very trite way. He writes this, If any of God's people should be tampering with sin because God can turn it to good, though the Lord does not damn them, He may send them to hell in this life. You see this? When you read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, don't you catch a tenor difference? 1 Samuel, what an encouraging book. Especially when you get the life of David, just... One after another, victories from the Lord. He walks with the Lord. He has a passion for the Lord. And then you come to 2 Samuel 11, and everything come, kind of comes to a screeching halt. And then the rest of the book, it seems one defeat after the, another with David. Sure, there's exceptions to the rule, but David lived such a difficult life after he decided to try sin for a time. Romans 6, 1 and 2 puts it this way. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? All things, all things work together for good. Dr. Johnson tells a story about this, a story of George Pentecost. He was a Bible teacher visiting a lady. She had troubles with her husband and then he died and she lost children as well. So she was going through a very difficult time, and he was having great difficulty encouraging her. So Dr. Johnson speaks. She was engaged in working over a piece of tapestry. It was lying on her lap with the wrong side up. And so George Pentecost said, well, I must say, that's a very ugly and ill-conceived design, if indeed it's, it's not without design. And then with a slight note of resentment that he had so rudely criticized her handiwork, she said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm surprised that a sensible woman like you would spend your time working over such a senseless piece of work as that. I can see nothing but a lot of confused ends and bits of wool, apparently masked without any order and furthermore, without any reference to color. There's no pattern or design about it at all. Whereupon she explained to him, you are looking at the wrong side. Of course it looks ragged and confused on this side. And with that, she turned it over and said, Now, what do you think? And he said, Well, it's, it's a beautiful pattern, I, I must admit. And then he went on to say, Like the tapestry, she'd been looking at life from the human standpoint, not the divine. He said, These things that have been happening to you are the confused bits and ends and pieces of your life looked at from the human standpoint. But when we get to heaven, you'll look back and say, what a beautiful design God has wrought in my life. For me, I don't know about you, but for me, the hardest part of trials, some of you all know Frank C. I'll quote him. He says, you just can't see the benefit. Correct? You can't see the benefit. That's the word, benefit. If you could, find, if you could see what the benefit of it was, you'd go, okay. Cancer? Heart disease? Okay. Uh, so these people are one to Christ? 
uh, my uh, prodigal grandchild has come to the Lord. Oh, this is great. I can see the benefit. No, you see, we're not called to see the benefit. We're called to trust the Lord. And really, a good example, the, the best example, best proof that all things work together for good. Don't say this out loud, but think of it. What's the greatest sin of all time? Greatest sin of all time. Well, I think we would all agree it's the killing of the Son of God. Of course. Putting Jesus Christ on the cross. He came to His own. His own did not receive Him. They crucified their own Savior. We crucified Him by our own sins. That would be the greatest sin of all time. And yet, what benefit it came out of it? Our own salvation. To quote Dan Duncan again, our greatest disappointments may be the first step to our greatest joy. So we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Number three, to those who love God. To those who love God. Note, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a condition, but a description. It's vastly different. 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because He first loved us. Is there a Christian who does not love the Lord? No. The Bible says, 1 John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. It's not telling us what to do. It's telling us who we are. It's interesting because it uses this in the present tense here. A believer loves God. Now, to be fair, there's times where that love waxes and wanes. We can get frustrated with the Lord's plans, the trials of life. But at the end of the day, by the Spirit alone working in and through us and in spite of us, we love the Lord. We see that God works for the good of those who love Him. Who are these people? These are the elect of God, true believers in Jesus Christ. Well, then it begs the question, what about those who don't love Him? I think it's interesting. Sometimes when they have um, tragedies, tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, and they'll interview people that have had to go through this, uh, you can hear the residue in their voice of someone that may have been raised in the church, but maybe they're not a believer. And they'll say something like this, The interviewer will say, how are you going to get through this? And they'll say, I don't know, but I know that God causes all things to work together for good. You can't stop there. You can't stop there because God does not cause all things to work together for good for unbelievers. For the non-elect, He doesn't. As a matter of fact, to quote Spurgeon once more, he says this, all things for the unbeliever work together for evil. Is he prosperous? He is as the beast that is fattened for the slaughter. Is he healthy? He is as the blooming flower that is ripening for the mower's blade. Does he suffer? His sufferings are the first drops of the eternal hailstorm of divine vengeance. Everything to the unbeliever, if he could but open his eyes, has a dark aspect. So the Lord works these things, and He's working them for your good. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, continue on. Number four, uh, to those who are called, to those who are called. This term called is not just a simple invitation, not just the general external invitation that Christ proclaims when He says many are called, but few are chosen. Rather, this sort of calling is a term known as effectual calling. If you will, think of the root word effect. Its effect is the salvation of those whom He calls. By this calling, God raises the dead. The Westminster Shorter Catechism states, effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit, whereby convicting us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, He doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the Gospel. Y'all, this is Romans 8. The calling of Christ. And we said here, it already talks about that verse 30, those whom He predestined, these He also called, these He called, these He also justified, whom He justified, these He also glorified. Do you catch that in verse 30? Not really speaking about this verse, but I have to bring this up. You're referred to in the future tense. In the future tense. That's how certain your salvation is. 
You're already glorified, seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So that's to those who are called. That's the fourth conviction. Finally, the fifth conviction is according to His purpose. According to His purpose. The cause of your election is wrapped up in the purpose of God. As far as I can tell, as far as we see from Scripture, you will never, ever know the reason why you were called. Because if the Lord has to point and go, well, there was this goodness in you one time, I could see down the corridors of history that you had an affinity towards me, and then I called you. If the Lord ever does something to that effect, then what are we doing at that very moment? We're inadvertently stealing glory from Him. He won't allow it. It's not best for us. You'd be eviscerated. No. As far as I can tell, you'll never know it. The Lord chose you unconditionally. Why did He do it? For the glory of God. Why did He do it? For the glory of God. Because He loves you. Why does He love me? For the glory of God. Okay, there you go. You see the circle. You're not going to get an answer. Because any answer that draws itself upon you seeks to rob the Lord of glory. So, be encouraged today. Your prayers and my prayers are often a mess, but the Holy Spirit cleans them up. Secondly, we don't know how to pray, but the Lord knows how we should pray, and He helps us to pray. So, be that your job, your life, your career, what do you do with children that are sick? You trust and obey. God is causing all things to work together for your good. He's causing it to work for your good. And you might look at whatever is happening in your life and you go, I hate this wrapping paper that this is in. This thing is awful. It's okay, I think, to pour out your heart before the Lord. Be careful. We do it with respect. But maybe we could relate sometimes when we don't understand, when you struggle to trust and obey, maybe you get a picture of that poor demonized boy's father in Mark 9, where Jesus says in verse 23, all things are possible to him who believes. And what's the man say? I do believe. Help my unbelief. And perhaps that may be your prayer today. Lord, I do believe you're working this for my good, but help my unbelief because there's a part of me that just does not believe. It's okay. The Lord is big enough. He can handle you. Finally, how do you know if God has called you? Some of you may be wondering today, you said the word effectual calling. That means not just the general call, but the effectual. That means the elect. Am I of the elect? Am I truly those of Christ? Well, I can tell you, how do you know God has called you? You believe in Him. By faith, you trust Him as Lord and Savior. You know that from here on out, He's your great shepherd. And you follow Him, stumbling all the way. But you follow Him in good times and bad. You know that He is working all these things for your good and for His glory. If I give you a little homework assignment, would you take it? Would you spend today reading Romans 8? Be careful, because you're probably just going to keep coasting all the way until the end of the book. It's phenomenal. But Romans 8 will draw you in and show you once again how these things are working for your good and God's glory. One last thing, I'd like to leave you with a story from an Arizona pastor. He relates it. A guy named Stephen Cole relates a December 1930 issue of Moody Monthly. It reported the tragic deaths Three people, Arthur Tiley, Mildred Kratz, who was a nurse who joined in that ministry, and the Tiley's baby at the hand of Brazilian natives whom they loved and served. While the Tiley's had made some progress gaining their confidence, conflict developed between the natives and the government workers who were attempting to erect a telegraph line through the area. Evidently, the tribe's animosity towards outsiders confused them and led them to attack the missionaries, who were easy targets as they opened their home to the natives. Mrs. Tiley, 
was the only one who survived. She was seriously wounded. But as I say, she, was, she survived. She wrote a letter on January 4th, 1931, 90 years ago, from the very place where she lost her husband, baby, and friend. She wrote, and I quote, We must believe that all happened according to the plan of an all-wise and loving Heavenly Father, even to the smallest detail. I do not say we must understand but only believe. She went on to describe the details of the attack, which left her unconscious after witnessing her husband's murder. Then she wrote, As I came back from the darkness of unconsciousness to find myself not only without my family, but to find my entire household gone. It was to know a father's care so tender, so gentle, that even the intense loneliness of the first day's separation were made sacred, and hallowed. So I ask you to believe with me that no accident has happened, but only the working out of our Father's will. To you who knew and loved Arthur, my husband, I beg you not to mourn him as dead, but to rejoice with me that he has been called to higher service. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your grace in our lives. Thank you for this passage. What a rich picture of the grace of Christ it is. Lord, we do pray for anybody in here who has not yet know Jesus Christ as their great shepherd, as the Lord that he is. Pray that you would grant them the grace they would believe. Pray that you would regenerate them today. And for the rest of us that are seeking to plow our way through this life in good times and bad, help us to realize that, Lord, all these things are for our good. You can be trusted. And the only thing in us that stirs up that says that you can't be trusted is our own great wickedness. In all these things, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you would please stand, we're going to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Before we partake of the bread of the Lord's Supper, this morning, I want to read some verses out of the first chapter of Paul's first epistle to Timothy. So, 1 Timothy chapter 1. If you've read enough of Paul's letters, you know that he was a brilliant thinker, guided by the Holy Spirit. And he also had a habit, seemingly, of shifting from one thought to another as one idea would suggest another. And so very early in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul takes issue uh, with some false teachers who were misusing the Mosaic law and making it a focus of their instruction, resulting in what Paul called a fruitless uh, discussion. Uh, there was a correct way to understand the law, Paul went on to say in verse 11, if, if you taught it according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And that thought that he had been entrusted with the gospel seems to have stirred in the apostle that sense of wonder he often experienced uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ had put a terrible sinner like him into the service of the gospel. He was so thankful for the grace that the Lord had shown him, and so he felt compelled to exclaim in verse 15 how it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Now, I am sure that was Paul's honest assessment of himself, but it could also be taken as the type of sentiment that really every recipient of the grace and mercy of God in Christ often feels at the realization of the great work of salvation God has accomplished in each of us. He sacrificed his own son, on our behalf, when we were only deserving of his wrath against our sin and a punishment that reflected the depths of our trespass against him. As Paul writes in verse 16, we have received mercy. 
And so it is with that sense of grateful wonder that each of us uh, partake this morning in uh, now the bread, a symbol of the Lord Jesus' body, which he gave over for us to death, a perfect sacrifice to God to atone for our sin, our sin understood in its most offensive character for it is expressed against our holy but merciful God and Father. And as we do so, uh, surely we have the same attitude that Paul had expressed in the 17th verse, now 1 Timothy chapter 1, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Let me give thanks for the bread. We invite all of you who are with us this morning uh, physically present or on the live stream and know the Lord Jesus Christ and understand that he died for your sins, we invite you to participate with us. Father, thank you now for this bread, which is a reminder uh, that Jesus intended it to represent uh, his atoning death on the cross. He took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. And we, in prayer now, ask Lord for the enablement to do what he asked us to do. Uh, our minds tend to wonder, wander, our uh, hearts uh, tend to grow dull. Uh, so, Lord, uh, uh, at this moment, we pray that you would enlighten our minds, stir our hearts to remember him in a worthy manner. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. In these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called... He also justified. These whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did, did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? There's so much here. We could lock the doors and have another sermon here, but I won't do that to you. It's interesting, the Greek term here, phedomai, phedomai, it, it means to spare. He who did not spare his own son. So it can be described or defined as spare, but it can also be defined as abstain. And even though this is not good grammar, it's a double negative, I hope you get the picture of it when it says, he who did not not abstain from sending his son. He didn't abstain. He certainly could have abstained. There are many things that you and I abstain every day. Thankfully so. Many bad things, sometimes we may abstain from good things. But you get the picture here. The Lord did not not abstain from sending His own beloved Son. The Lord could have easily, easily, uh, could, have, could have decided, no, this is not what I'm going to do. The Lord did not have to send His Son for anyone, anyone, and He would have been perfectly righteous in sending us all to hell for eternity, perfectly righteous, and yet He did not not abstain from sending His Son. He did not spare Him the cost. Let's give thanks for the cup, which symbolized the blood of Christ that was poured out for us. Father, we give you thanks. We know that ultimately when it's, you say that this blood is the cup of the, is the <clears throat> new covenant, the blood of the new covenant, Lord, ultimately it's a picture of your death. The fact is you died. You, your son died for us. We should die. And we will die unless Christ should return. But when I say death, we should die eternally for all the sin that we've committed. The fact that we were not only born into sin, but we practice it every day. And yet, Father, out of your grace and mercy, you would send your only Son to die for us. Perfect substitution on our part. You would die for us. Ultimately, we could not substitute anything for us because we're such sinners. 
but only the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In Him we give thanks. In His name we pray it. Amen. Close the benediction from Romans 16. Now to Him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. The Lord be with you.